Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is a good morning. Good morning. We uh, we just need to be here this morning. Sorry, Sister Nancy's back under the weather again. So sorry about that. Uh, and but but again, but. Uh, just keep her in her prayers. Thoughts. You know, the this has been a good week uh, in many, many ways. We have trials through our week. We have trials sometimes through our weekends. We have trials from day to day. And the way we deal with those things is what it's all about. Uh, we can hang on to things, we can let them fester, we can just get clear out of sorts, you know, and sometimes that does happen to us. But I'm so thankful. Hungry, faint, and poor. We are hungry. We're faint, which means we, we don't have any strength. And we're poor. How are we poor? When we, when we are really so rich, we can't hardly hold on it. When we go through, these, through times, the Lord tells us not to, I'll use my own words, not to uh, be afraid of these times that comes in our lives when things are difficult. But look forward to them. Count it all joy, James says. And uh, these, I can just go to that scripture so many times Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, trials, hardships. Count it all joy. Why? Because the Lord will bring us through that time and He will allow us to look back on that time and we can rejoice. For if we were not going through those hard times, it seemed to me like we wouldn't even be able to rejoice. In anything, the hard times causes us or allows us to come to a time of rejoicing in the Lord. And that's what this is all about. This is what being here this morning is all about. <clears throat> Let's turn to the book of Matthew. I'd like to just read some things here. And I don't know. I've read some of, of it off, just jumped around there. So I don't know if the Lord will lead anything. I don't, I don't know. We'll just read and, and see. But in the fifth chapter of Matthew, of course the Beatitudes are in here, but I want to drop down to the very end of it. In the or not, in the twelfth verse, I want to start out. Fifth chapter of Matthew in the twelfth verse. Well, back up to the eleventh verse. Could I? I don't know, it just touches me. Eleventh verse. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In this 12th verse, rejoice. That's just what I was talking about. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Exceeding glad. That just don't mean to be happy. Just that exceeding is a, a great joy. Is what is is great. Is what it is. <clears throat> exceeding, not receding. Exceeding. For great is your reward in heaven. This is not talking about heaven up yonder. We know this. It's talking about the heavenly things on this earth, the kingdom on this earth that Jesus Christ set up for us, that we may have joy in these times in our lives. For great is your reward in. In, in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Every one of those prophets were persecuted in ways we can't even imagine. Can't even imagine it. Then he goes on and tells us, ye are the salt of the earth. The strength. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, if his salt has lost the strength, wherewith shall it be salted? If your salt 
If you waver, you're losing your strength. When we get weak, when we lose strength, what happens to us? Satan enters into our lives, brother. And he can do it so quickly and so... Uh, he's so good at it. So we must always be on guard for these times that he's enters in. He can tear us apart so quickly. And there it goes back to one of those things. When he goes through these times, so the Lord will enter into our lives in a way that we he would not have had we not had these difficult times. But wherewith if if the salt shall have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing. We can rejoice in these times, but to be cast out and be trodden among foot of men. This is what happens. But he tells us, ye are the light of the world. And we, we need to remember that. We may not, we may be small in number. We may not think anybody pays any attention to us, but I guarantee, brethren, they do. They may not understand anything that they see in each one of us, but in some manner, we are the salt of the earth. We, we don't have to say a word. It's through our actions. And, and our actions is what it comes down to. Our actions are the salt of the earth. Our actions are. Because other people see us. They look at us. They, they, they judge us by our actions. And we're all, obviously we're all guilty of these actions from time to time. But boy, if somebody sees those actions, I guarantee you they'll jump on it with both feet and they'll make sure everybody else knows about it. These ill times that we have. Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick. Now that candlestick is something that rises up above your, your level normally. It's something that's higher. And that candle, you can put a candle on a candlestick and what happens? It lights the room. Lights the area around it. If you put a candle under a bushel, we'll just say that, a bushel basket, turn that upside, put it over a candle, darkness remains. So let your light, now, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. That simply means puts it out where people can see it, the light, but not the darkness in us. They can't see that. Okay. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work, works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven, not glorifying the man that comes forth with the good works, but that they might see Jesus. That they might see Jesus in our good work. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not, Jesus says in the 17th verse, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill that law. And to fulfill the promises of the prophets. And Jesus has done that in, in, in a complete way that we, we have a hard time understanding. He fulfilled every law, every jot and tittle. Verily, for verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass... One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus done that, accomplished that. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness 
shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Through our own righteousness, we all know that we cannot enter in to the kingdom of heaven through our own righteousness. It's the righteousness of the shed blood of Jesus Christ allows us to enter into this kingdom. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, or in my Bible, Rekha is vain fellow, you vain fellow, shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. That's not a eternal burning hell either. It is not. It does not exist, brother. Not in the way it's taught. But there is indeed a burning hell. So we don't ever want to forget that because it's real. But I'm sad sometimes that people are taught, and maybe I, I'm off base here, but I'm just sad that people are taught so much about this eternal burning fire that you're going to be cast down, that, you can, and that even those who do not seem to be believers, I don't know. It's just, we are not to make that judgment. We are not to make that call. We are not to call our brother, Rekha. Rekha, you vain fellow. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there the gift before the altar. Leave it at the feet of Jesus, if you would, and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother. Be reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary, <laughs> Satan, the adversary, deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. These are plain words, brethren. And in my mind this morning, we can't even deny these words, what they're saying. They're very plain to me. And this plainness comes through experiences that we have while walking with the Lord and while walking with the brethren. These are experiences that are, are powerful and they're needed in their life. They're so important in our fellowship with Jesus Christ. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. And the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt be no means, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. We pay. And sometimes the uttermost farting, it says one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. Now, I don't know why they put something like that in there, but it's a very nominal figure right here. The farting, that's what it's describing, the farting.
going over to the 38th verse. I mean, there's these other things uh, in these next few verses here, uh, but I just want to go on over to the to the 38th verse. You ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. You resist not evil. That's not evil people, evil men. It's things that happen in our life that is evil. Things happen in our life that are evil sometimes. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, Turn to him the other also. These are actions, evil things. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. That's a precious one. These are all precious. You have heard it said, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say, these are the words of Jesus Christ, you're all reading it, but I say unto you, I'm not saying this unto the world. I'm saying unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. This is totally contrary to our way of life. It's totally contrary to to our desires. the, The flesh desires to do these things. Hate your enemies. But here he says, I love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Turn to the 15th chapter of John. Just a little bit here and then I'll close. 15th chapter of John. We all know this. We've all read it time and time again. And yet, every time I read it, it's, it's new in a sense. It's just, it's just new. <clears throat> I am the true vine. First verse. 15th chapter of John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, this purging, I do believe, are the experiences that we go through from time to time. He purges us from the way we're walking in, if you could think of that way. And it's kind of hard to put a comparison on it, but every branch that bears fruit, he does, he cuts it back a little bit. Sometimes we have to be, be stopped. Sometimes we have to be, be made, slow down, slow, bit, slow down a little bit and see, see what life is about you. See your brethren as they are, beautiful, loving, Sometimes we just have to be brought down to a point 
we don't know which direction we need to go. But as we go through these experiences, this is what I'm relating to Purting to, is the experiences that are so difficult in our lives sometimes. But he purges it, the good one, that it may bring forth more fruit. We come to more of an understanding. Count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations. When these things happen to us and we go through those things and look back at how Jesus brought us through that, we then bring forth more fruit than we had before we had that experience. These, the bringing forth these experiences is what causes and allows us to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ and in His Word and in His ways and how it affects our lives. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, Jesus Christ. No more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Without me, ye can do nothing. We can't bring forth good fruit without Him. We can't do the good works without Him. We cannot glorify God without Him. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. If a man dwelleth not in me, with me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. It shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Bear much fruit. In so doing, we shall be the disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. God bless you. with me. Father, we thank you for the words that we've heard this morning that um, you've spoken to us this morning. These many truths that we know these things are the uh, keys to the kingdom and the way to live, it, live our lives here that our, we might experience the kingdom with you and these, we just thank you for these words that you've spoken to us we ask you to help us to continue to think on these truths and a way to live our lives and we ask you to help us to uh, live our lives in these according to these principles that we know our lives will go well when we live our lives according to your the way you would have us to live so we ask Father that you'd help each and every one of us to Apply these principles and walk by these principles in our lives. And we just thank you for these words that feel like you've already 
uh, blessed us through the preaching this morning, mm-hmm. and we thank you so much for that. Thank you for the, you know, we just thank you for the words that Brother Gary has spoken to us, and ask that you would uh, continue to bless us during this meeting, continue to be with us as we uh, worship you and open the scriptures, and we just thank you that you just seem to know the things that we're in need of, and uh, we just thank you for the uh, blessing that you've given us today already. We thank you for being with us throughout this past week, and the, uh, just for being with us throughout this week, and the many the strength and guidance that you've given to us, and we ask that you would continue to lead, guide, and direct us and as you go with us throughout this meeting as we open the scriptures that you would open the uh, open our ears to hear these the words that you have us to hear. So again, Father, we just thank you for all these things and again, just thank you for your goodness to us, toward us and as you would continue to Lead, guide, and direct us. We ask that you would forgive us of our many sins and shortcomings. And we thank you, Father, for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Good morning. I really appreciate that. I, I really don't want to spend much time up here. I don't want to take away from the preaching we just heard. That was good preaching this morning. I really appreciate that. We need to listen to that. We need to take that with us. Uh, yesterday, Brother Ed, he preached about the foundation. The, he preached about the... the uh, the church and it's uh, kind of its foundation, you know, and its floor and its walls and its roof and its ceiling and its, you know, the and he kind of applied all these things about how we're all these things. And I really appreciated some of the things he brought out. And but I got to thinking about that, and I don't have a big sermon on that. I I really don't. But you know, Jesus laid that foundation. And he laid he did he laid that and I how did he lay the foundation of the church? How did he do that? Well he did that in his life. And we just heard some of those things that Jesus Christ himself, God himself, manifest in the flesh as he walked here on this earth. Some of the things that he laid out as the foundations of of the doctrines that he wants us to walk in, but he there's something there that that we need badly in order for our righteousness to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's to have that salt. I think it's the spirit. That's what gives us that life, that zest. Brother Kevin used to call it that zest, that zing, that life that's in us. That which the Pharisees, they didn't have that. We have that, Sister Sonia. That's what will exceed. That's what will give us the ability to walk in the steps of the Lord Jesus Christ that our righteousness can exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's what we need to be praying for every day, brethren. When these situations come up, that's how, Brother Gary, when situ and they arise. We would be lying if we said they didn't. Situations arise in our lives weekly that come up where we can get out of sorts. That's true. We just acknowledge that, all of us. But what do we need to deal with that, to take care of that, is we need the Spirit. 
So when these things arise, we can lay down our gift at the altar and we can go and be reconciled to our brother first. And in that 25th verse of that fifth chapter, I think that's who the adversary is there. But it's not really that your brother's the adversary, but it's the flesh will get in the way and keep you from going and being reconciled. Or Satan's behind it, you're right. He's going to be the one that's going to try to stop that. He's using the flesh. And each one of these, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye. What what causes you to want to somebody hit you in the eye? What causes you to want to hit them even harder in their eye? The flesh. And Satan's going to ag you on in that. Yeah, after all, they deserve it. Your eye, it hurts, you know. They hit you hard. But the spirit is what we need to be able to turn the other cheek. So, and the spirit is able to do that. In the spirit, we are. In the spirit, we are able to do that. So our righteousness can exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. So I feel like that that's the one of the foundations. These things are foundations. It's not a building. I'm glad Deer Creek has been there for 200 years. I'm all glad about that. I'm glad. I'm glad this church has been here that long. I'm glad the Lord has, in His grace, caused it to be here this long. But the Lord has, He has kept His church for 2,000 years. And honestly, it's gone back farther than that. It goes back to Abraham, really. It goes, actually, it goes back to Abel, if you want to get technical. Actually, it goes back to Adam and Eve, because the Lord said that the seed of, of Satan would be against the seed of Eve. And it started, you know, the first time we see that is in Cain and Abel, we see that. But anyway, we're not, in technically speaking, but so Jesus laid these in this teaching. You know, he laid these foundations, brethren. He laid these parables out. And you know, you, can, you understand some of these parables you know, Jesus gave you a hearing ear. Amen. You know, that's a foundation in his church. And you know, nobody can lay that foundation but him. Nobody can give you a hearing ear but him. That's a foundation that only he can lay in your life personally. That's remarkable to me, that he gave you an ears that can hear. Well, we see that in scripture where he calls the deaf to hear. He, 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 I don't, he stuck his fingers in that man's ear. I don't know if it was a... I'm not even going to say it. You know what I'm thinking. But he laid the foundations. And over in John... Well, let me go over to Psalms. And I want to I wanna quit here in just a second. Because I, I want you to lay hold of what Brother Gary spoke to us this morning. Um, Psalm 11 and then I want to go over to John He said, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Now that sounds like somebody being persecuted to me, doesn't it? And somebody's telling them to flee, and their response is, I put my trust in the Lord. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? 
if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I think he's saying, but the foundations aren't destroyed. If the foundations be destroyed, then what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in the heavens. His eyes behold, behold his eyelids try the children of men. This, this person that's going through this experience, he realizes, like Brother Gary was saying, we go through these trials and these tribulations. And that's what this person is saying. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. The Lord knows what's going on. And his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that, him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord, uh, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. And I also wonder if you can change that around a little bit and say, his, count, his countenance doth the upright behold. Because Jesus said that. Over in John, 17th chapter of John, Now this is a prayer of Jesus. He says, I have glorified, uh, I'm sorry, 17th chapter of John, the fourth verse. He says, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now he hasn't even gone through the crucifixion yet. And he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He hasn't finished the work he hasn't finished that work of suffering the crucifixion yet. So what work was it that he finished? Well, he finished setting up the kingdom. He finished laying the foundation. He finished preaching the truth of God, right? He said that he, he must, uh, they were trying to kill him in different places. And he said, I must tell that Herod, that fox, that I must continue this day and that day and the next day. And then, I can't even quote it, but he said things like that, that he must continue. And he was finishing the work that the Father gave him to do. Yes. Setting up the very things we heard, the teachings, right. and teaching these parables while he taught on his way to being crucified. You look at that 15th chapter of John, he was on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified and he's teaching them a parable about the true vine. Except you be joined to this true vine, that you won't have this life in you. And he's on his way to be killed, to be crucified and suffer a horrible death, suffer horrible affliction first, and humiliation before he's crucified. But he says this before... He says this before he has actually suffered all that. He says, I finished the work you gave me to do, Father. Yes. So he's talking about a different work here. You talk about a man that had work to do. You talk about a workman that was busy doing the Father's will. And he even said that when he was a young boy. He said, I, I must be about my Father's business. And he was certainly not slothful in business, was he? He was constantly doing his father's will and laying the foundations and building the, these foundations that Abraham was out hundreds or thousands of years before out in that wilderness looking for a city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. And 
Jesus Christ is God and he was the builder of this city that Abraham was looking for thousands of years before yeah. that he was out wandering in this desert looking for this city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God and it's a spiritual Jerusalem that's garnished with these beautiful stones. I think that's these beautiful doctrines. This city's not like any other city. Nope. This, I mean, It's not like, uh, uh, Brother Ed, he did a beautiful job yesterday, but this city is explained in the, in the book of Revelation, and it's got streets of gold. It's got walls that are garnished with these beautiful stones that just, if the sun shined on those stones in the wall of that city, it would just magnify the glory of God. I, I got a little tickled to Brother Ed yesterday. He's up there trying to talk about the glory of God, and I could see the frustration because he couldn't come up with words. And I thought, bless his heart, he wants somebody to say, Hallelujah, the glory of God, because he was talking about predestination and that we're supposed to. And I told him that in the handshake, and he, he kind of laughed. He said, Yeah, you're right, you know. Because we're all just sitting there, somebody say something, you know, is what I, I could tell. He was getting frustrated because he couldn't come up with words because there's not words. To He was talking about heaven itself, and yet you can't even explain the kingdom of heaven right. in words. They use the most outstanding words and these gems and these stones to explain the kingdom of God. Here on the earth, they yeah. use these diamonds and these different gems well, we went to the Smithsonian. You look at those things, and you're like, wow, those things are just amazing. And as we was looking at those things at the Smithsonian, these things, some of these gemstones were like two and three feet tall and this wide. And Ian and I were like, and they put a light on the top of them to give them that glare, that glare and that shine and this radiance. And Ian and I were like, wow. And you know what Ian said? He said, yeah, and those things are just found in the dirt. Yep, yep. Those things are found in the earth. And that just like hit me like a ton of bricks. That's here on earth. Amen. That's the Lord's kingdom on earth. Amen. Amen. Yeah, they're here in the earth. They dig those up out of the dirt. Isn't the Lord wise? Isn't he wise? There's not words for it. His foundations are, his foundations, they're not like our wooden foundations. They're glorious. They've got these stones, these gemstones, what we call the most valuable things. Why, well, if you had one of those, well, you'd be a millionaire. You'd be so rich. Well, you know what? I said, if you had those, Sister Dolly, well, you do have those. You do have those. Not just her. Everybody in here. Think about that. You do have those. It's not a tangible thing. And I'm not criticizing Brother Ed. I enjoyed his sermon. He had a good sermon yesterday. I enjoyed that. But you do have those gemstones. That's right. it's, in fact, it's so magnificent, we don't understand them. We think we don't have them because we read it and we say, wow, that's too marvelous. Streets of gold. I've never walked on streets. Yeah, you have. You've walked on streets of gold. Amen. You know what the streets of gold are? Amen. That's what Brother Gary just read to us. I, that's charity. Yes. You know what the streets of gold are? Cha that's charity. That's when we're, real, that's when we're in the spirit yeah. of Christ Amen. walking in charity. You're walking on streets of gold. And you know what that is? Those streets of gold are like transparent glass. That doesn't mean you see through it. That means it's like a mirror. You see yourself for what you are, and you see your brethren clearly too and love them. Amen. You see clearly. You have a clear view of each other, but you see yourself clearly. You see yourself as a sinner, but you see your brethren as righteous, and I think that's charity. Mm -hmm. But you can see your brethren's faults too, and still love them too. Yeah, sure. You can see you can have a you can have kind of a falling out for a minute, but still love your brethren and deeply, and not let that yeah. not let that somehow ruin. That's true charity when you can see the fault and love them anyway. You can see folks with their faults 
and recognize it for what it is and still have that deep love. That's God's love. He loves us in spite of what we are. He loves us. That's true charity. When you have, you see people, and we know that already. I'm not telling you anything, but that's a precious gem. Gold, gold, is gold a gem? Gold's not a gem, is it? It's a metal. But that's a precious metal, and that can be melted down, but it comes out even purer when it's melted down. So to me, that's what Jesus finished. Boy, he just finished it, didn't he? He just, I mean, there's nothing. Is there anything that he didn't complete? in his foundations, in his teachings? that is there something he left out that, oh, well, he should have taught this? There's not. I mean, he finished it. And so this is before he even suffered. And then over in the, over, and you know, that's just, this is before, so the 17th chapter, this is his prayer. And he's praying in this, Father, I've finished this work. You know, I've glorified thee. That was part of that work. He glorifying him on the earth and yeah. finishing that work and um, teaching these things to these 12, teaching these doctrines to these 12 men. Yeah. And these 12 men believe those things that Jesus, and that is remarkable to me. He started his church with 12 men and that this church has grown and is still growing today from these 12 men. Is that not remarkable? Now, he really ingrained this in these 12 men and taught these 12 men. His church is still standing today from 12 men. Well, we think that's impossible. From 12 Jewish men over somewhere in some foreign country, and it's even here in Spencer, Indiana, you got to be kidding me. That can't happen. But it's here, and it's still here. And so he, he prayed in the 17th chapter. They come and get him in the 18th. And it's all downhill from there for Jesus. And then in the 19th chapter, they're crucifying him. And in the 30th verse of the 19th chapter, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said... Yeah, it finished. is finished. Yeah. It is finished. Now it's finished. Yeah. And he bowed his head. The Son of Man bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He died. God himself manifest in the flesh died on the cross. Then it was finished. It was finished right when it was supposed to be finished. Then his complete work was finished. After he had completed all his teaching, then he gave himself as a sacrifice for our sin. Then it was finished. So I thank you, Brother Gary, for what you brought. I thank the Lord for what he gave you this morning. Those are, that's sound teaching. And you know, that uh, one thing before we go, another one of Jesus' teachings. Jesus said this, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And the and you know what the and no matter what the rains are going to descend and the floods are going to come, 
and the winds are going to blow and they're going to beat upon our house, whether we build our house upon that rock or not, that's going to happen. That's just life in the church, right? It's going to happen to every one of us at some point. So it's up to us whether we build our house upon these teachings, we fashion our life after these things or not. And I know we often fail. I know that. But I know I do. God bless you all.